This is Coda Radio, episode 106, for June 16th, 2014. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as your show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our excellent host on the East Coast, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Hello, hello, Chris. Hello, Mr. M- Mr. Michael Dominic. You back at the homestead this week? Back at the old family homestead Now, uh, correct me if I am wrong, I am not uh, particularly good with dates, but I do recall, I think, in the back of my mind, didn't we just recently have a birthday for one Mr. Michael Dominic? We did. It was on Friday. Happy birthday, sir. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I I thought so. I'm so proud of myself. Well, uh, this week... Uh, we're going to do our Google I.O. predictions and a couple other things. It's not all Google I.O., but you know what we like to do here is we like to line up kind of what our expectations are, what we kind of think the consensus perhaps might be from the development community or what we suspect it might be, and then see how those line up with the actual results of the big event. So Google I.O. kicks off next week, and so this is our last chance before that to kind of put it all out there and be on the record and really stick it out there because we could get stuff way wrong. <laughs> I love it like that. Uh, so. Best way to do it. Incorrect <laughs> and with conviction. That's right. Uh, but we got a lot of really good feedback this week, so I want to just jump right into that because we kind of need to get rolling. Is that cool with you, or is there anything you want to cover let's, on the top? No, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, Fabian writes in, and he says, Hey, Chris and Michael, I have kind of a dilemma here. I've been developing in PHP, and I actually have been liking it. But now I started developing a bit more complicated applications, especially when using modals. From an example, Twitter Bootstrap, I generate the modal with PHP and then print some JavaScript. That opens the modal. It works, but it doesn't really feel sophisticated. I really start to feel the need for a framework to get more organized code and maybe even speed up the development. I checked out Laravel, or Laravel, I'm probably saying that wrong, but it seems a bit complex and I don't know it. Maybe it's time to move on to other languages. I don't really know what to do next. I've been thinking about the following things, though. Reuse my PHP skills with Laravel, or Laravel, however you're supposed to say it. Learn Ruby on Rails, or wait, maybe Rails isn't hot anymore, I'm not sure. Maybe I should look at something else like Scala, please, maybe play. Client-side frameworks and useful backends are also something he's looking into. He says, here's the rub. He's 17 years old, and right now, I'm developing an internet for a little company where I got my internship. I tend to go to the, I would tend to go the Ruby route, a clean syntax, and gems are awesome. Performance is not an issue because I won't be building the new Twitter. I tried developing in Java, but I felt that it was a bit too complex for me. I want to focus on building an app instead of, you know, the other way around. Could you give me some advice? Thanks for the show and keep up the good work. So he's 17 and he needs to build an intranet. What do you think, Mr. Dominic? That's ambitious as hell. Um, (laughs) Maybe they don't need a lot. (laughs) I'm going to go ahead and just answer his question in a roundabout way. Okay. Well, I'm not a PHP guy, but what I know a lot of PHP guys are currently using is called Cake. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's supposedly a very Rails-esque PHP MVC framework. Yeah. I would check that out because it seems to be very popular, very accepted. Um, you know, you don't really need to learn a new language, though I really think you should. Not because I'm not going to bash on PHP. I'm just going to say that you probably should learn more than one language or maybe even bone up on your front-end skills if, if that's, you know. I, I kind of I think it's kind of funny he's even asking us because I feel like uh, he's already answered his own question. Yeah. I mean he likes Ruby. He doesn't need the massive scale of a Twitter. It, to me, it sounds like he's kind of already narrowed in. He just needs somebody to tell him it's okay to go that direction. If he wants to go Ruby, I mean that's certainly a, a very viable option. Yeah, I mean uh, it's served a lot of people well, and uh, like he said, if he feels like the gems are something that he grocks and makes his workload a lot easier, go for it, man. Get get do it. You know, nothing wrong with it. All right. Next email comes in uh, from Dirty Zero. That's a good one. And Dirty Zero writes on Coda Radio. Mike and Chris mentioned a new technology called Metal. Mike even insinuated that all you Linux people are in trouble. I'm just wondering what is it? The name makes it more or less impossible to Google. Metal. Metal is a thing that's going to kill OpenGL, basically. 
<laughs> no, yeah, not that, really. That, but that, that, no, but that that's what metal is, right? So it's a more op. Supposedly, it's going to be a more optimized graphical framework right. to work with on mobile, it's, particularly iOS. It's written specifically for the A7 chip and presumably the A8 chip that'll probably come out in the fall. Yeah. And I don't want to get into like a you know a pissing contest. Is it better than OpenGL? I mean, by virtue of being more focused on one platform, it's probably going to be better on that one platform. Hell, it's focused on one chip. Well, and I, the early benchmarks do seem to indicate yeah. a pretty significant performance lead. Um, the thing is, is that it's iOS specific, and iOS isn't getting rid of OpenGL support. Oh, I guess it might work on the Mac, too. I don't know if they're releasing it for Yosemite. But, you know, if you need to target Linux or you need to target Android, you're still going to have to write OpenGL, at, you know, your game's in OpenGL. So, I, I mean, it's... I think it will reduce the amount of OpenGL stuff that's out there, but I think initially it's going to be probably more used for like designers to make their UI slicker, don't you think? Because the other thing, by the way, about Metal is because of the way they've engineered it, people are also speculating it could save on battery life too. Uh, I'm not sure Metal is going to be used in business applications. No, but, no yeah. it's for like shiny little animation things. No, I no. mean the core animation does that well enough, and. The, that's a lot of ah, work. I see. Right, right. Yeah, I, see. I, I don't. I don't see anybody doing metal right. for that. What I do see is like, let's talk about games like Infinity Blade, where they're exclusive to iOS. Right. And Apple touts them. You know how beautiful, how awesome iOS gaming is. Well, this is only going to make that. You know that line of logic all the more stronger for Apple. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if they do uh, manage to make this work on Mac OS, which I guess they couldn't because it requires the A7 chip. But it seems like to me that's the missing piece. If you could. If you could make it something that's essentially a competitive to Microsoft's DirectX, uh, yeah. then it makes it really easy to target those platforms, and those platforms already have a lot of advantages to be targeted. Well, and what it does is it makes it all the more costly in terms of not only money but also performance to, you know, to target Android, right? Hmm. So. Yeah, it's it's almost, you know, how we see some of the apps that come out iOS first. If there, if there's some if there's a shop that says, well, we're going to target iOS first, and they go the metal route, they might have to stay on iOS. Or they would incur a much higher cost, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's, I guess it depends. I mean, unless it was like a you know server client, Android, the client one uses all OpenGL stuff, and iOS it uses. Uh, all... yeah. I mean, you could see big game shops doing that. You could. I mean, that's that's great in theory, but I, I have a feeling. <laughs> what metal, a nightmare! <laughs> yeah, metal, and the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of people aren't. Most people, even if they're using Unreal, aren't actually writing OpenGL, right? They're writing to the graphics engine in the game engine they're using. Right, yes. So what's probably going to happen is that, let's just use Unreal, the Unreal Engine, for, for an example. Unreal will just optimize on iOS to use Metal. Yeah. So through no work on your own, your game will run better on iOS by virtue of magic. Now what does that say to a smaller to medium-sized shop? You know what? We could invest less time if we just kind of go iOS. You know what this underscores to me is the massive advantage Apple has by having uh, their own chip manufacturer in house because they are building the A7 because they're and they're building Metal and they're building iOS. Uh, they're kind of able to offer this lower level of access to the chip that I can't see any uh, what other manufacturer out there, with the exception of maybe BlackBerry. I mean, Samsung could do this, but it would be something specific to Samsung devices, right? So it would be yeah. not across the Android platform. I guess RIM could do something like this, but they don't even make their own processors, so they they couldn't do this. This is this is genuinely uh, an Apple advantage. Now, will it actually materialize into a market advantage? I don't know, but I think from a technology standpoint and an implementation standpoint, it's undeniably an advantage in Apple's uh, camp here because they have this whole stack. It's pretty fascinating. Well, this is the whole Apple thing, right? They tie everything together. They own the whole widget. And by virtue of that, it all kind of just works, right? I mean, we all... I, but I just wonder, you know, I, I, I just wonder how much we've underestimated the fact that they own that chip plant. Because look at uh, things like Touch ID. They have a secure enclave that's built into the processor, right? That uh, and, and look at look at the transition to, and I don't it's not really a big deal but I mean again like they were the first to roll out 64 bit uh, right there in their in their phone the, the iPhone 5s is a 64 bit handheld yes, now, it's it not, is. yes it is now it's not used for anything but nobody else was able to unilaterally ship a, a, a processor and the entire OS stack overnight into 64 bit it's it's not perfect but it's it is showing an, an advantage now. But what's funny is I don't know if it actually has materialized into a real market advantage yet. 
It's impressive technologically. I'll give them well, that. Well, I mean, metal has the potential to be a huge advantage in terms of gaming on mobile. Whether that materializes or not, personally, I think it's going to. I, I think um, I think it's fair to say iOS games have a bit of an advantage over Android games. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. Well, I mean, I'll save some of my thoughts for our I/O stuff, but I think that's an area that Google's gonna go after, though. I think they're gonna have to. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Well, our next email uh, is in, it's about information overload. We could probably relate to this. Comes in from Sudor, I believe is how you say his name. He says, "I tend to browse at least 200, 300 Google Plus 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 posts, emails, blog posts, Reddit, and Hacker News items every single day." As part of it, I follow Android developments on Google+, Android subreddits to learn more about development process, market, and the latest happenings, etc., etc., in the technology industry. I feel like this is starting to get a little bit overwhelming, though. The bright side is I feel like I learn a lot about Docker, OpenShift, and discovering awesome libraries to use in current or future projects. But is this just part of the trade? Am I doing something wrong? How can I avoid this information overload? Thanks for the show. You guys are amazing. Loves it. You have this problem? You get information overload? You know, I, I do, and what I did is I just kind of stopped following everything. Uh, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to be on top of, you know, the four new JavaScript frameworks that have been released <laughs> since we started the show, like today, the last 15 minutes. <laughs> At yeah. some point, you just have to kind of say, I I think, you know, you start broad, and then you sort of narrow it down a little bit. Um, I, I'm, this is, I'm biased, but I also think this is a reason why podcasts are particularly strong right now is... Uh, you get people who are passionate about that subject matter to cover it, and they just essentially aggregate the best stuff for you, assuming you listen to the right podcasts. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, I am such a podcast fan. So that's how one of the ways I do it. I um, I, I do a lot of news. You know, I have a daily tech news show. Then we have all of the other shows that we do. So I, I track a lot of stuff. But the way I do it is I've refined a lot of good sources over time. And I know which ones to go to at different times. I've also been recently sort of resetting up my Feedly uh, subscriptions to sort of pare that down to the stuff that really performs. But honestly, um, I, I can't believe I sound like such a hipster when I say this. But I've been I've been getting a lot of value out of Twitter for my news. I, and and it, lately I just go there. I've I've been sort of... I've been spending a couple of months refining who I follow and what who breaks good news and who retreats good people and stuff like that. And I find it a good way to get a digest of what's going on that day. And then you combine that with other sources. But what you like this weekend, for example, I was pretty unplugged, like not fully unplugged because I had to pre- prepare for a show sure. and stuff like that. But uh, you know what I've been doing is I've been bringing a laptop home with me this week and I've been leaving the charger here at the studio. So I can only work for as long as I have a battery charge. And then I essentially... That's really clever. Yeah, and then I'm just stuck on... I can get like emergency stuff done on mobile devices, but I'm not going to do anything serious. And it's it's like... Because, you know, there's two me's. There's there's Chris who knows that I need to set boundaries and I need to like uh, have limits and have family time. And then there's Chris who is in a jam and just really needs to get something done and isn't 100% sure he's not going to be able to have time in the future to get it done, so he wants to do it now. And so what I do is I let smart Chris trick that Chris and so I don't bring the power adapter home and then that Chris doesn't have any options and just has to wait. And it works. Uh, so far. <laughs> It could backfire on me, but that's one way I help avoid overload. That and podcasts. That's my that's my prescription for you. Okay, Mr. Dominic. Well, we've got one more email I want to get to, but first, I think I'll thank our first sponsor since we've been talking for a little bit. And this next one's a nice long one too about uh, confidence and whatnot. And I think maybe maybe some folks could relate. But first, I want to thank Digital Ocean sponsors of this week's episode of Coda Radio. What is Digital Ocean? Oh. Oh my goodness, you guys, DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server, and that is legit. Users can create a cloud server in about 55 seconds, and pricing plans start about only $5 per month, and this gets you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, yeah, an SSD, a blazing fast CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. Plus, DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. Their interface is simple. Their control panel is super intuitive. And power users can replicate it on a much larger scale with their straightforward API. And here's a little pro tip. Go check out their New York data centers where you can set up private networking between your droplets so you can have back-end database servers that are not exposed to the web and they don't count against your transfer. It's a really nice system. And DigitalOcean's control panel allows you to set up droplet images so you can replicate servers and get them up and running super fast. And at $5 per month, you're like, hey, that's a great deal. But guess what? We got a special promo. Use our promo code CODERJUNE. When you check out, you get a $10 credit. $10 credit, you guys. 
and you can try out that ten uh, five dollar rig for two months. Or if you need a little more horsepower, go grab the ten dollar rig and try it out for a month for free. Or if you just need some testing, use their hourly pricing. Yeah, they have hourly pricing. Lots of good stuff over DigitalOcean, including a great community, fantastic bandwidth, fantastic servers, and those SSDs really make a difference. DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code CODERJUNE when you check out. If nothing else, use that promo code CODERJUNE and just go check out that dashboard I've been talking about. You guys, if you even if you even are just a technology enthusiast, you're going to be impressed by what they've managed to do. And when you think about the technology on the back end that they're orchestrating with an interface like this, so much respect. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code CODERJUNE. Get that $10 credit. And a really big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. Okay, so our next email came in uh, from a listener who's having some confidence issues. He goes by Dustin. He says, hey, Mike and Chris, I'd like to start off by saying I love the show. I'm emailing you because I'm having a terrible confidence issue that I thought I could try my luck and see if you could help. Maybe I can get some input from you guys. I've currently, I'm currently enlisted in active duty in the U.S. military and have been going to school full-time towards a bachelor's in computer science. For the past four years, I've been relentless in my pursuit of being a programmer to the point that I have got dis- a discipline for sneaking my programming textbook and laptop into our hardened shelter when we got told we might get mortared that night. Now, the end of my enlistment is finally coming to a close, and I'll be graduating with my degree months before it concludes. Initially, I was extremely excited about getting out and starting my career, doing something I love, but every time I look at the job description, it kills my confidence. I swear, every time I see an entry-level position that requires three years' professional experience, and my heart skips. I feel, though, that even I've spent the majority of my time mastering old tools, and I feel like I've spent the majority of my time mastering old tools, and picking up new ones such as Git, SQL, Android, and Java EE. I'm always going to be at a disadvantage. I can program circles around anyone who I've ever even gone up or uh, grouped up with, but I still have the fear that showing up at a job and having no clue what to do. My biggest question is, what does somebody expect of an entry-level programmer? Because these job descriptions make it seem like I have to be working as a programmer for the past four years in order to get the job. P.S. I love the hoodie. I only wish it wasn't so hot so I can wear this thing around. Also, I understand Mike is hiring but my data separation is still a bit way. Much love, Dustin. So what do you think, Mike? What what do you expect from an entry-level programmer when you hire him? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Uh, we don't expect three years of experience because that's really stupid. Um, obviously, you have no experience, although in this case, I would say you do have experience because you have military experience. But in general, in terms of programming, we don't expect a lot. Um so we kind of expect no experience for our entry-level programmers, right? Mm-hmm. But the disadvantage of that is we pay crap, <laughs> and we're yeah, on the other side. We're willing to train. So if if you're if you're, it's kind of a double-edged sword. But the reason you're seeing these crazy job postings is because most, uh, you know, folks who come out of college with a computer science degree expect to make fifty grand or better out of school. Mm-hmm. And most businesses just can't pay you that and not have you be productive for, you know, two months, three months, right? Right. So what happens is you either go to a place like like Fingertip where we will pay you very little to start um, but train you or what will happen is, you know, we've had cases where folks have come in and said they knew more than they did and we've had to let them go and that's always unfortunate. Oh, yeah, yes. Well, and I, I, I feel, you know, to be fully real with him, uh, I, to me it looks like a hire's market, a buyer's market, if you will. And so they're it's, able it's, to put. Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely a, a higher risk market. Yeah. Too. So the other side of it is you can ask for the know, sky. If you know your junior, consider taking the lower paying gig at the smaller company. You know, obviously I have skin in the game here, but but certainly don't like if they say three years experience, don't say you have it. Right. Right, don't lie. And it's all it's it's a hires market, which also means firings are super easy. To yes, use and this. because it's a hires market, sometimes I think we have to be willing to consider working arrangements that, in a booming economy, we maybe not would not settle for. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, depending on your situation, when you get out of the service, if you could work for six months or for the summer as an intern. What you will find is these companies that have these requirements, these hard three-year experience requirements or four-year experience requirements, they'll, they'll all of a sudden become really flexible on that if you've worked there for a little bit and you've proved that you're valuable to them. If you're a good worker and you go there and they say, man, this guy's really helping us out. I can't really imagine not working with this guy. A company will generally find a way to make that hire happen, even if they have to bend a couple of those rules. 
And it, but that that requires that maybe in some cases you might even be working for free as an intern for a little while. And I know for some people that's just totally not possible. It's un un you know no way. But for some people, yeah. If you're if you are lucky enough to be in a position where that could work, maybe you're living with some family or I don't know what your situation is. Uh, gosh, uh, this is the time where you could make that kind of thing happen if you have no experience, but you've you no know, actual on paper experience. I, well, I, I don't you know. know. I would even add that there there are a lot of little companies around, and not even tech companies, right? Little companies who need developers or need that kind of work done that are actively hiring and having a hard time recruiting people because they don't pay fifty grand a year, right? Right. right. So if if you're really having a tough time finding work. Consider going into like your local deli. I mean, uh, you laugh, but this is this works in in towns or small cities, right? Say, hey, are there any smaller shops that are hiring? Because chances are they can't afford to throw a job at a monster dot com, right? You know, it's like five grand to put something up there, Chris. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they're they're going to be a lot more willing to negotiate with you in terms of if your experience isn't exactly what they want, as long as you're upfront with that and you're willing to understand that you're going to make. The bottom of the barrel to start yeah yeah uh and i you know i think too like if if you go in even if they have that three-year requirement you could still submit and if by some lucky chance you got called on what i would be looking for for somebody is if they didn't have the experience i wanted i would be looking for an eagerness like a thirst to learn and right. indications that they pick things up fast because a, a lot of cases you know, companies do things really kind of uniquely anyways. They have some pretty specialized setups, so they might, you know, you even if you know how to program, the bulk of what you have to learn could be how that company does that job. And it can that can take months regardless of who you are. So sometimes right. companies look at that and go, well, it's only slightly more investment to bring him up even further to speed, so let's hire him or her and we'll just do it if they think you have an aptitude for it. Yeah, and, I, and you know, I would also just throw in there, every company's process is going to be a little different, and it... I mean, this doesn't really relate to the uh, – well, I guess it could relate to the writer. But just in general, the process you would have done a project in at college is radically different from what you'll see in the real world, right? Yeah. And the process at a larger shop is radically different from the process at a smaller shop. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, if you're just out of school, if you're living with mom and dad, if you can afford to kind of, you know, take 10 bucks an hour or whatever and you really can't find work – I suggest you do it. Get some experience and see if you can't work your way up. Yeah, and in the meantime, uh, just uh, you know, keep getting as much experience as you can, even if it's your you know projects that you just work yeah. on or whatever. Uh, and you know, it is kind of perfect. So, just one one thing on the internship thing too. Yeah. We have one intern at Fingerpick. We actually pay our interns a stipend. Yeah, good. Yeah, I think uh, you know, I think companies that can afford it should, if they can. I actually disagree one of the reasons we don't have a lot of interns is because of how much more complicated it became in the last two years to have interns oh really yeah they've been changing the laws as someone's pointing out in the chat room oh that's a pain uh, in the ass but what that means is that we're treating new fresh hires at a school like interns so we're we've actually lowered our offers our hiring offers for junior people hmm. because we we can assume they haven't had a new real work experience as interns because it's it's unless you pay them a stipend you know, it's very much against uh, certain laws in certain states. Now, that stipend can be anything from a penny to a dollar. Huh. Huh. <laughs> but what you'll, yeah, it, it's, I know a lot of folks, especially when you're in college, you feel like I shouldn't be an intern. People better than you have done it. <laughs> and you're only hurting yourself because that, that couple thousand dollar decrease in your salary is going to last over a couple years to make yeah, up, right? Good point. When if you had done that one three month summer internship for free or for a small stipend, you would have been a little better. Yeah, and um, you know, the, you know how I got into the technology uh, IT field was I basically volunteered for the first job that hired me at a school district. I volunteered for a year for free because I just wanted to do the work, yeah. and I was a kid, and I became valuable. And then they're like, well, well we can't really not have Chris around anymore, so we better hire him. Well, the issue we've been having, we've talked. I mean, we're going to get off this because we're beating a dead horse. But we we're getting all these, uh, you know, four year comp sci degree kids who can't pass FizzBuzz. Oh, and yeah. So it's it's, you know, on the one hand, still a thing. You, huh? you didn't want to take the internship when you were in school because you felt you should be paid for your work. Well, your work's kind of of no value if you can't pass FizzBuzz, right? That's incredible. So, yeah. So it it's a 
it's tough. I mean, it's definitely tough out there today. To, I would not want to be graduating college today, that's for yes, sure. Yes. Well, uh, you know, you touched on something uh, that segues actually to our next sponsor, and then we'll get into our Google I.O. stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned, like, that the labs you have in school are not necessarily going to prepare you for when you actually go out into into the real world. And I think, you know, one of the things people could do is during this transition is you could also check out a service like Linux Academy, who's our next sponsor, because one of the things Linux Academy does, and go to linuxacademy.com slash coders, is they have real-world scenario-based training. And they have this across the board for their different courses. But the one that I think is actually really smart before you actually get money on the line and you're working for clients or something like that, or you get in the position where you're supporting an AWS, you know, an Amazon Web Services application, they have real-world scenarios where you're integrating all of the various AWS services like S3, like the web front-end stuff, uh, even Glacier. They have all this, the, the whole range of Amazon Web products, and you build an actual product. Like one of the labs is like an image-serving site where you have an application that has to be able to retrieve different images, and you utilize the very EC2 for the server, you know, S3 for the back-end storage. I forget what the Amazon Web front-end caching is, but that's involved. Even the DNS management. At the end of the scenario... You walk away completely knowing how to deploy an application on that group of Amazon Web Services. What's great, too, is there's quizzing material as you go so you can check yourself. They have video guides you can download. And while you're in that port part of the courseware that's using the AWS services, they spin the instance up for you so you don't have to spend that money on that time. So you're not going to get a surprise bill at the end of the training course because they're managing that for you. So go get started by going to linuxacademy.com coders. They have step-by-step -step video courses, downloadable comprehensive study guides, you can keep them on your own and read them offline. In, each lab comes with their own servers when they're needed. And if you want to learn the Linux stuff, they have seven plus Linux available distributions you can pick from. The course material adjusts to that distribution. It's pretty awesome, too, because you get to keep track of your progress and see how you're doing. Check in with yourself. Check in with the community as well. They have a community over there where people are discussing the courseware, discussing how their certification tests went. This is a good way to sort of get some mainstream learning really right now at your own pace, at your own time, when you have time available linuxacademy.com slash coders. Don't worry about all this stuff. Just go there and try it out. Try out their different course material because if you go to Linux linuxacademy.com slash coders, you'll save $5 a month. That's a special deal only for the Coder Radio audience because I want you guys to be able to get in there. This The way the subscription works is they're adding new content every single week and you have access to all of it. So you want to you wanna do a deep dive into OpenStack one week? You, no problem. You can do that. You want to do a deep dive into AWS the next week? No problem. Linux system administration basics, you got it. Uh, you know, LAMP stack, database backends. They have the whole range of web services you might need to develop your applications on top of. You can get you can get trained on the fundamentals of those technologies. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. And a really big thanks to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Coder, Ra Coder Radio program. This is a great service for you guys. And it could help out a guy just like Dustin who can go try some real-world scenarios. That way he maybe has a little more confidence because he's actually done some deployments in a safe area that gives you guided step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. It's a pretty good option. Okay. All right, let's talk about Google I.O. It's coming up next week. Uh, so Google I.O. officially kicks off at 9 a.m., I think, Pacific on June 25th, which is a Wednesday. Oh, so we could have technically done this on the 23rd, but I like having a little distance. That way people can't claim that we just read other people's predictions. So I think that's probably actually a good thing that we're doing it this week. Um, why don't we start broad, Mr. Dominic, because I don't think you'll have a lot on this. Do you think we're going to hear any more about uh, Google's home automation. Uh, back in 2011, we heard about Android at home. It's essentially stayed quiet. Some people speculate that they're sort of revamping it and they're going to announce a new home automation, sort of like HomeKit, but probably even broader. Do you think that's likely? Are you excited about it? I think we are. I'm not that excited. And I, the only reason I think we are is because they bought Next, right? I'm sorry, Next, Oh, Next, not Next. right, yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I think this home automation stuff isn't... Uh... It's never worked. Yeah, it was a bad idea. It's always been a bad I idea. I would like to see something that worked across all devices, you know, all OSs. Then I would maybe be able to get a little excited about it. Okay, next one. I figured that would be a quick one. Google Smartwatch. I think we're going to see one. Do you agree? And do you think it's going to be a big deal? I agree. Not going to be a big deal. And I think it's going to be the LG brand. I think it's going to be a square one. And I think people at the conference will get it. I think everybody's kind of thinking that. All right, next one. Are we going to get a new Nexus tablet? Yes. Oh, I I almost wonder if instead we're going to get a Chrome OS tablet. What do you think of that? I think it's almost time. I think Chrome OS has been slightly 
Well, you know what? I, I would I would enjoy that as much as I enjoyed Swift, so. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. What about instead of a Nexus tablet, what if it's an Android Silver tablet? Do you think we'll see the Android Silver stuff at uh, Google I.O.? Um, honestly, I think we're seeing the Nexus 7 got a little fat and went 8 inches. Okay, 8 inches. Uh, yeah, and they'll call it the Nexus 8? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think we're going to see a less expensive Chromebook Pixel. I think the Pixel's a pretty interesting device. I've played with one at Linux Fest Northwest, Noah's, and I really liked it. I would never spend the money they require for it, though. But if they could drop that down, uh, the Pixel's actually a pretty nice piece of hardware. And so I wouldn't be... I would. I kind of hope we see an updated Pixel at a decent price, maybe half so, the price. So let me raise the stakes for you, Chris. Okay. As Apple thrown down the gauntlet with Swift, does Google now make Go an Android coding language? No, I don't think so. I don't think so either. No, that'd be crazy. Maybe, maybe, maybe they'll... Dart. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I, well, maybe not this year, but maybe next year. I don't know. To me, honestly, it feels like, and I hope I'm wrong, but it kind of feels like Google's got nothing. No, I'll tell you. Okay, well, I got one more yes, no, right or on. maybe, and then we'll get into some of the big stuff. Are we going to see Google Plus integration at a whole new level up the yin yang this year, or are we going to no, see them pull surrender. back from? Really? I'm thinking surrender. Yep. I think they're done. I mean, didn't, uh, what was it? Yeah. Was it Paige or Bryn who was uh, interviewed by Recode that said it was a mistake? Oh, did he? I didn't see that. Yeah, I thought... there was something. Go chat room, Google around for it. You'll find it. It was It was totally, It was, well, it was crap to begin with, right? They just wanted some of that beautiful Facebook juice. Well, I think it's hurting their reputation because you know what I, I, I overheard just between you know regular people the other day was, uh, hey, are you on Google Plus? And then the person responds, yeah, because I have to be. I don't use it, though. Well, the thing is, uh, as a developer, working with the Google Plus API is an epic pain in the ass. Like, I can't just pull someone's incoming Google Plus feed, which I horribly discovered this month, uh, which causes all kinds of annoying problems with the customer. Yeah, I don't yes. know, man. I don't, I don't. I think they're too in. I think they're too far in. No, I mean... It's a space I mean, they have to... I, I don't think they have a choice. I think they have to do this. In a weird way, Google Plus is very anti... You know, they they preach on about this open stuff. That's kind of the brand, right? Open. It is probably one of the most closed APIs I've ever seen. I've heard that before, too, yeah. I, it is the most restrictive API I've used. Apple's APIs are more open than this. I, and and they've, they've been asked about it, and they've said, well, we're going to open it up when it's time, but how long has Google Plus been around been, now? It, no, they're not going to open it up. That's bull. There's no clients that can post to Google Plus, are there? Or oh, that's not Forget true, about but... posts. You can't even. So if if you authorize my application, I can't use your auth key to pull all of your incoming content. Really? Now that would like say you had a circle A, a circle B, and they're both incoming in your feed. Yeah. Use Facebook's term. I can't pull them both in, a, in an array. I can't pull them both in a stream. You have to go circle, but it's it's ridiculous. It's it doesn't not. sound like they want people integrating Google Plus functionality into other applications. Yeah, it's just it's it's not practical. It, it, I mean, I use I, you know for a while there I was a heavy Google Plus user, but now I go on it's it's obnoxious. It's just you know it's gifs and cat pictures. Yeah, I also. Um... I also find like during big events, like Google Plus is a ghost town. Like uh, during E3 or during a big event on TV or a news breaking event, like the Twitter feed is so is so spastastic with with uh, news that I put filters on to to sort of follow just like my most trusted sources. And I'm just and it's like a waterfall of constant updates. And I'll go on Google Plus and there'll be like five minute gaps where there's been posts and nobody's talking about it and then eventually somebody will post like here's my blog post where I talked about the the news event that happened today and here's a picture because I can do that on Google Plus or here's my YouTube video or here's a every now and then every now and then you'll see like here's a hangout of people talking about the thing that's breaking right now and but yeah. there's not nearly the the level of uh, of vibrancy and, and aliveness when there's a, something big happening like there is on Twitter um, and maybe that's a good thing, to be honest, because uh, I, I just find I just use them for different stuff, basically. Uh, you know, I mean, I think to be honest, I think we've given Google Plus more time than it was. Due. OK. All right. Uh, so um, uh, this is what I want to ask you. And I mean, like, I don't mean like I mean, like in a really big way. Do you think like there's going to be a big theme from Google where they go at app developers and they say, guys, this is the year you've got to have a better design. We want you to lay I out think your... that's what this is going to be about, yeah. 
Because don't you feel like even when Google lays out certain design aspects, it's still just all over the map with Android apps themselves? You know what I would like to see, and everybody in the world is going to hate this? Uh-oh. <laughs> I'd like to see uh, the Google equivalent of the human interface guideline. Now, they have their design guideline. Oh. But I'd like to see an actual, if you don't follow this, you're not permitted in the store. I think it's wasted effort. I don't think they'll ever do that. Uh, there's no way they'll do that hard of a line, but... I, I wonder if they could start maybe using like the featured sections more in the Play Store and like sort of how Apple does to sort of sort of indirectly say, hey, you play ball. I mean, I don't necessarily like it at the one hand, but I also see it as a tool to improve the ecosystem. So it's like if you walk that line and maybe Google could walk that line better than like Amazon and uh, Apple do. See, the Android Play Store, I mean, I'm rocking the Nexus, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, HTC. HTC M8. Yeah. And it, the Android Play Store is kind of a ghetto. I know. It's it's not good. You know what? You know, one of the reasons I like my NVIDIA Shield is because NVIDIA, and I, I normally don't like these kinds of things, but NVIDIA has put a UI on top of the Play Store where they, they have built out their own store, and then they just link to the Play Store. So when you install from the NVIDIA Shield Store, it just opens up Play Store, and you just get it from the marketplace, which is the perfect combination because the UI on the Shield to navigate, like, it makes it so much better to just navigate right. the games and stuff, and it, it play has... Never been strong in that. I would love to see a redesign to the Play Store announced at Google I.O. Uh, okay, what about what about design in Android itself? Like a new theme? Are we going to see Android 5.0? Is it going to be a refocus on the... This is a year after iOS 7 was announced. Google didn't have as much catch-up, I think, with Android UI that Apple did. So Google isn't under as much pressure to really do something big and splashy. But I wouldn't be surprised to see them tip and t tuck and, and, you know, clean up these old corners over here. What do you think? I think we see a small um, kind of refinement of what we currently have in KitKat, but I don't think they're doing anything drastic. I hope they're not. I'll put it that way. Yeah. There's a few areas I wouldn't mind seeing. Like, uh, I, I still think there could be more work done on the uh, uh, application transitions um, and, uh, and things like the, uh, the the sliding lock screen. Uh, on the lock screen, the uh, notification shade behaves kind of funky sometimes. I think there's some UI improvements around that. Uh, but, yeah, I'll, you know what I think? What I've been impressed with over the last year is Google breaking stuff out into the Play Store. It's been bad because it's, they've taken closed source applications and sort of just shelved them and created and created these or taken open source applications and shelved them and created these closed source replacements like for basically all their core apps. But... I mean, there are much better applications, and they're in the Play Store. So those have been improving between I.O. releases, and that's something that, you know, is legitimately something they've improved on in the last couple of years. I'd like to see more stuff like that. I'd like to see something, again, better addressing Android updates on, on a larger scale. I would like to see details about Android Silver, and I would I hopefully be something compelling that keeps these high-end smartphone prices down like the Nexus line does right now. Yeah. I don't I mean, think silver keeps the prices down. I think see, silver is just Google Play. It's the um, Google edition, right? That's all it's going to be. This is no good. From a developer standpoint, you need to be able to buy a $350 unlocked phone that is sort of the, this is the Google device. This has got a decent camera. It's got a good screen. It has the most recent technologies, NFC, wireless charging, and it isn't going to cost you $680 to buy it unlocked. If that's what these Android Silver devices are going to be. These, if you buy an HTC Silver or an HTC M8 unlocked, it's the Play Edition. These, I just, you know, and I'm worried about a much higher barrier of entry for getting good devices in the hands of developers because I. Good, good. sorry. Uh, I like barriers of entry, Chris. Don't you know that? Yeah, I mean, I do, but I just think it means if that barrier of entry is, I don't think it means we have less apps. I think it just means we have crappier apps. No, yeah, all kidding. I, I don't think the Nexus was ever that that developer tool that you thought it was really yeah because you know the iphone being 600 bucks off contract didn't stop people from developing iphone apps well i don't think people buy it in the same way like that because you don't have to buy as many i, I devices to begin with right, but the nexus is also a relatively small percentage of the google market yeah i mean if you're a developer and you're optimizing for market share you're probably optimizing for samsung right right, right. so you got to get a galaxy you got to probably get, get galaxy maybe a droid Maybe you get a Droid and you probably get whatever the crappy phone Verizon at and t are pushing, probably like the LG, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, I mean, the you're not the Nexus. 
Actually, the Nexus is one of the easiest ones to just not worry about, right? Right, because at least, people, yeah, gosh, boy, that's a harsh reality. I didn't... I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a project where the colors on Samsung tablets are slightly different, and it took us forever to figure that out because we didn't have the specific tablet. You are bumming me out. We had to go buy. We had to drive to Best Buy, buy the damn tablet, load the software on it, and we found out. Oh my God, the hues are—they're just like one notch off. Because we thought our customer was nuts. Yeah, I would too. I would. I would be yeah. like, yeah, they're seeing. We it had right. it on on uh, you know some no name tablets. We had it on a couple of Nexus tablets. Nothing. <clears throat> Loaded it on the Samsung. Holy crap! The colors are wrong. Computer, what happened? Um. All right. Uh, okay. So, boy, you know. <laughs> I, I that I is a really harsh reality. Breaking. You're just you've just burst my bubble. Like you yeah. just burst it. I I cuz I I felt like the Nexus program was one of the really good things Google did for the uh, smartphone market. Like I feel it's, like it's a great program but not for what you're saying. And it's I guess for, you right? kind of helped me you're helping me understand why they might transition to the silver program actually. It kind of does make yeah. sense. And it's actually it helps that it helps soften the blow of that cuz I've been pretty upset about the death of the Nexus cuz I really like my Nexus 5 and I really like the price, and I really like I mean, what one, you get for the price. One thing I'd say, if there's a Nexus 6, I'm just going to pick it up just because it would be the last <laughs> Nexus. Dude, maybe they're just keeping this rumor going to just make more sales. <laughs> you know, I think they should call it uh, Nexus 6, the last of the Mohicans. Like, play the music behind it. <laughs> I'd, I'd totally get into that. I'd like that. Uh, all right. Well, uh, okay. Got to ask you about glass. Are we going to have... Oh, uh, get out of are here. Are we doubling down on glass? or? Oh, I hope not. Glass is a bad idea. I think they should just focus on the watches. Give me a tablet and give us a new line of phones, and I'd be happy. Listen, if they double down on glass, street crime in San Francisco is going to go up significantly. You've heard about this, right? Folks getting jumped for yeah. Google Glass, and yeah. But isn't that going to happen with all wearables? I think we need to stop and think about the implications of things like Google Glass before we start selling them. What about watches? Same as thing, as really. Watch, watches are going to have a microphone in them. They're going to have GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi yeah, access I, points. I or, think there's some serious issues, yeah. Um, I hope not, but I think they're going to do it. Hmm. I mean, I don't think they're doing consumer glass, but I think they'll mention glass. They'll Because those folks spent $1,500 per unit. They're going to say something, right? I wonder if they'll announce glass 2.0 that's cheaper. Let me ask you this. Would you? Uh, what would it take... To make Michael Dominic, you mean you have the HTC One M8? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What would it take to to make you want to pair a Android or Google smartwatch with that phone? Like, what does it have to do? A lobotomy. Really? There's nothing like. Hey, uh, you don't you don't find like Google Now to be a useful feature that if you just have that on your watch all the time? Uh, so there is a certain level of creepy I'm willing to deal with. I think having something strapped to my wrist is going to be where I draw the line. But what's the difference between having it on your wrist or having it in your pocket? T to be honest, not much, and I'm I'm more and more uncomfortable with Google now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just want to throw this out there. If you're a felon, they strap a thing to your ankle that has the same functionality as the Google Watch. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. Right? okay. There, 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 there's a level of creepiness that I'm that I'm starting to see out of Google in particular that I just it's making me very uncomfortable. Yeah, I I am there with you, uh, and I keep I keep trying to ask myself, you know, is this worth it, and those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, Google now is neat, but it's not practical enough for me to be like I'm gonna, you know, give up all the privacy. And it's not I'm not you know I'm not a tinfoil hack you know government guy like you and Chase are. I'm more a, well, what if someone manages to compromise my device, guy? He's a jackass. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Uh, this is Google now one, two years in. What if we're Google now five years in and it's, you know, it's a handy mother effort. Like it maybe notices if you're forgetting about something uh, and it could vibrate your watch before a meeting. And, you know, like what if Google now becomes a little bit like, you know, an actually very useful tool that helps you make your life a little more organized when you're busy? Yeah, so there's a balance between useful and creepy, right? And right now I think they're way too much on the side of the creepiness. They're not giving me enough functionality. Now, if it becomes to the point where, you know, Google now turns into Cortana, not Microsoft Cortana, but, you know, the character from Halo. the game. Like, yeah, like your your virtual assistant where she, using the female program because the voice actor is female. It's Garjo. Thank you. Can, or like Hal, right, whatever. Yeah. Can kind of 
talk to me, have an intelligent conversation with me, anticipate my needs as a you know human personal assistant would, then I might be willing to compromise more of my privacy and more of my but data. How can they do that without starting at this level and monitoring you and learning about you? Like I was thinking about this the other day. Hey, hey, Chris, I love vaccines. That doesn't mean I'm willing to take your experimental one in the, in the arm, right? Okay, fair enough. Good yeah. point. Let it let other people be the guinea pigs, right? Right. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day is Google now knows every day when I drive from my house to the studio and when I drive back because that phone is always with me. And when I go into the dashboard, you know, I see these, this here, this here. And Google is learning about a new routine that I have in the last few months of my life. Uh, and I don't know if I have a problem with that, but I, I do wonder how much people actually stop and think about that. Is Not there at all. is there you, yeah. you might be five to 15 years into this and realize that this company has essentially established a behavioral pattern of your life for the last 15 years. Is that a bad thing? Let's kick it on. Uh, let's kick it up a notch, Emerald style. We get into some of this health functionality. You know, you're on the toilet. Perhaps things aren't going well, Chris. You know how it is. And then all of a sudden, bing, your watch goes off. Consider some Metamucil. Oh wow! You think they'd do that? I think if I was a marketer, that would be an amazing opportunity. You're at your most uh, yeah. It's it's almost vulnerable. So one of the things. So one of the things that changed the way I think about Google, where I used to be like. I was balls deep into Google. And then one of the things that made me sort of change my mind is I read Into the Plex. Yep. And I realized... Great book, by the way. Anybody should read it if you haven't. Yeah, if you're, if you're all in on Google, you should read Into the Plex. And, and then I, you will be all out. But... Well, what I realized, too, is so much of Google's not being evil and not being creepy currently hinges on the two guys in charge. And if those guys step away from this company... There is an army of marketers that want to do the creepiest as possible, and they have been holding them back, saying, no, we cannot cross this line. And well, when those guys are that, gone... Those lines have moved. Right? They do move, yes. They do yeah. move, yes. Absolutely they move, because they they evolve over time, too. And yeah. you know, I'm sure they get whittled away. But what I realized is, is these guys are going to be super, super far into our home, super far into our lives, and then at some point... Larry and Sergey are going to leave or one of them is going to leave and what that company is willing to do with the data they've already collected will change. And we have to ask ourselves if at that point, is it going to be too late? And I know this sounds so paranoid. It sounds so conspiracy. It sounds so over the top, but I, nobody's asking these questions in a real serious dialogue. And I didn't mean to turn this into a Google bashing thing, but I do, I do have to say I am more interested in what Google does as far as pushing technology forward, moving platforms forward like Android, and less interested in the things like the glass and the watch because they are beginning to cross that threshold for me. And I'm like you. I'm kind of willing. I'm like, have at it, Haas. Like, if you want to have it, I'd love to see how it works out for you. But I don't think I want to participate just yet either. And I don't think yeah. I'm going to be buying a Google watch either. No, I, I mean, I, I might buy one for work, and if somebody wants to develop something it's, it's on really it, it really depends sure. on how compelling it is and how, if I feel it's going to be creepy or not, I think. And how, like, if if there's a trade-off and I continue to feel like the trade-off is worth it, I, I just try to stay vigilant. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'm a little old-fashioned. I Right now, I feel like Google treats folks kind of like cattle in terms of harvesting their data and, and setting them up for marketers. Wow. But, hey, I think that's a good place to leave it. And yeah. uh, send your hate mail to Alan at JupiterBroadcasting.com. <laughs> oh. Alan at JupiterBroadcasting.com. Uh, before we run, I just had a subreddit pick. Uh, the subreddit seems to be pretty excited. CodaRadio.reddit.com is our subreddit. About Brackets 0.4, a new release of the Brackets uh, editor, sort of a competitor to Sublime Text. Hasn't replaced Sublime Text for me yet, but I've been noticing a lot of folks in the audience talking about it, so I wanted to give it a shout-out. We'll have a link to the new release in the show notes with the brand new UI. Well, new UI improvements. So check out Brackets, and thanks to the subreddit folks for submitting that in. And like Mr. Dominic did say, we would like to hear your feedback, good and bad. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, re we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this after Google I.O. and see how we feel. Maybe Google I.O. will really blow our socks off. And, uh, I mean, I'll, get, I'll guarantee you one thing about Google I.O. They're probably not going to release Swift. So they'll probably be better off right there. So you can oh. count on that. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and send us your feedback over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Click that contact link and choose Coda Radio from the drop down, or visit coderadio.reddit.com and join us live, won't you? We do this on Monday at noon Pacific. Go over to jblive.tv for that, or just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar and get it converted in your time. Easy peasy. Mr. Dominic, where should we send folks to find out more of what you're up to throughout the week? Uh, they can go ahead and find me at Tumanuku on Twitter and go find Fingertip Tech on Facebook. Awesome. It's just fingertip tech. Very nice. 
All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Coda Radio. We'll see you right back here next week.